So what do I mean by object-oriented programming? Well, first of all, if we take a look at the word orientation, well, I could take the Earth, which is an object, and then we have planets around the Earth, those are all objects, and the Sun, which is a star, which, again, orbits around the Earth. So we could say that those planets and the Sun are oriented based on the Earth. It's what it's based around. And so our programming is based around objects. So in order for us to understand what we are trying to base our programs on, we must understand objects because that's what we're orienting around. We have objects and our program is going to access objects, modify objects and move data around within objects. So it's vital to understand what is an object. So let's start out with the real basics. Your program can only contain nouns and verbs. That's it. Programming is very simple. Nouns and verbs. Nouns are descriptive. So take a look around you. You live in an object-oriented world. And each object has its own properties or nouns. These describe the object. So I'll take an apple, for example. It has a width, it has a height, it has colour, it has weight, and so on and so forth. So these are some basic properties of the object, or nouns of the object that describe it. Next, you have verbs. Verbs are performing an action, which is a function. That's exactly what a function is. So you have nouns, which is descriptive, and verbs, which are functions. And functions like verbs, for example, could be eating the apple. That's a verb. Also, I could throw the apple. That's a physical action. So, again, it's a verb. So, verbs are functions. Now, when a function is within an object, it's still a function, but we give it a different name. We call it a method. That's it. So, when we say method, it simply means a function that is contained within an object. That's it. That's how easy an object really is. So to give this some perspective, what I want you to do is think of, let's say, creating a graphics editor, a lot like Photoshop. I have a canvas, and on that canvas, I can have several images. Let's say I have three images in total on the canvas. Now, what we have is three objects on the canvas, three images. And for each image, I have the X and Y coordinate where the image is placed. Then I have the width and the height of the image. And I also have the image data itself. So now that we have all of this data and it's collated together, all of these properties are encapsulated, put together, I have each object which resembles each image. Now let's imagine that objects didn't exist in programming, which is just impossible. But let's say they didn't. How could I then group this data together? The simple answer is I couldn't. So for each object, all of those properties will be let loose. How do I know which property, which noun describes which image? The simple answer is I don't. That's why objects are so important, because they allow you to group information together that relate to certain aspects of your program. That's why it's important. Now, to really get this object orientation in your mind, what you need to do is think about this in everyday life. Look around you. Look at all the objects you have. Just look at your computer. Take a look at the width, the height, the color, the size of the keyboard, the trackpad type, so on and so forth. Again, this is all very, very important. And then look at what you can do with the computer. I can type. I can smash the computer, which normally that's uh, under angry. And then on top of that, you also have a whole host of other verbs that you could do to your computer. So that's the whole idea, is the fact that when you group data together, it becomes so paramount how important objects really are. And if you don't understand objects, you will not understand any programming language. It doesn't matter what it is. Now, to really ingrain this into your mind... 
apply it to your everyday life. Just visually think of those parentheses all the time and adding properties and verbs into those parentheses for each object you come in contact with. For example, you wake up in the morning, you go ahead and get the milk out of the fridge. So I'm going to picture the fridge. I'm going to open my parentheses, those curly brackets. And then within there, I'm going to take a look at a few nouns that describe this fridge. So it could be the make of the fridge, the size of the fridge, and so on and so forth. Then on top of that, I'm opening the fridge door. That's a verb. That's something that I'm doing to that object. Therefore, I'm running a method on that object. I'm opening that fridge door. If you keep thinking like this in your everyday life, I guarantee you object orientation becomes a breeze. Now the next level is embedded objects. So we've already established that objects are very, very simple, but objects can contain objects. Just like in everyday life, objects do contain objects. Again, think of your computer that sat right in front of you. Well, it's not just made up of one object. It's not just classed as one object. You may have a camera in your computer. You have a screen. You have a keyboard. You have the trackpad, each of which have their own nouns and verbs associated with each component in your computer. And you can break it down and down and down and down and go as complex as you would like. But then what I need to do is encapsulate all of those objects and components together into one object. So here you can see it's all encapsulated into one object. So this right here is a hierarchy of objects. We're establishing an order of objects. We have the sub objects and the main parent object. And when you think of something like a car engine and all the components of a car engine, again, you can go into some serious depth with your objects. So we've understood one encapsulation. Encapsulation is grouping data together, whether it be nouns and verbs or both. And if you really want to remember encapsulation, just think of a capsule that contains many chemicals and so forth that you stick in your gob and swallow. Then also we have nouns which describe the object and verbs which are actions performed on that object. And finally, objects can contain other objects. Now, if you understand all of this, you will understand objects. So now we know what an object is. We now need to know when it comes to programming, how to define an object. We can be very general and say an object is a thing. Well, we understand the concept of an object. The whole point of object oriented programming is to make our programs closer to the real world because we live with a bunch of things that we class as objects. But what criteria is our mind really looking at to define an object? Take a mug, for example. Is that an object? Sure. Is a desk an object? Yes, of course. And even the device you're using to watch this course on is an object. The same as food, for example, an apple, a banana, grapes, and so forth. They are all classed as objects as well. So all these things are objects. And here's the clue. They have their own identity separate from other objects. Now you can have multiple objects that aren't necessarily unique. For example, you take a device, you purchase a device. Well, there could be millions of devices exactly the same, a carbon copy of what you have, but each one is classed as an object. It has its own identity. Each one of those devices can store different data. It doesn't rely on those other devices. Each one of those has the user's preferences and apps on there, and it's unique. It has its own identity. Even though it looks the same, it has exactly the same physical look and style and features. It's still an object because it still has its own identity. Now, there may be objects out there that you can't actually physically touch or look at. For example, a bank account. A bank account, it is unique. It doesn't rely on any other bank account. It has its own interest rate. It has its own amount of savings that you have in that account. And also it has every other piece of information to do with that account. 
even depositing and withdrawing money from that bank account. Again, that's an action you can perform on your bank account. So your bank account in its own right has its own identity. It is an object. So not all objects are physical. The criteria is, does it have identity? Yes, because they're self-containing. They have their own identity. Now, the easiest way of finding out if something is an object or not is by putting is the in front of it. But if I was to say is the printing or is the running, well, they aren't objects. Lots of people are able to run and any printer can print. So printing isn't unique and running isn't unique. It's not self-contained. It could be applied to many, many objects and people, for example. So in its own right, they're not objects. Likewise, if I was to use descriptions, for example, is the red, is the tall? Well, those nouns such as red and tall, well, they are not unique. There are many people that are tall. There are many buildings that are tall. And that doesn't give us any sense of identity whatsoever. You could have a red apple, a red car, a red post box. Again, that noun is not unique in and of itself. So we need to look at identity. Even you and I are objects. We have our own identity. So for example, if I say, is the person, well... That makes sense. So a person is also an object. Now, I know many people don't like to think of themselves as an object, but in all truth and definition, you are an object. Now, the key rule here is if you have a noun, for example, red, tall, short, and so forth, and if you have verbs such as printing, running, jumping, and so forth, they are not objects. Nouns and verbs on their own are not objects. However, a person has nouns. They have words that describe them. For example, you could have a person that has blue eyes, long hair, a skinny body, and that individual can perform certain actions, such as running, jumping, walking, talking, and so forth. So what is an object? Well, it's collecting, grouping together nouns or verbs or both. So you can have nouns and verbs grouped together. So whether nouns are grouped together, verbs are grouped together, or nouns and verbs are grouped together, it doesn't matter. It's an object. Likewise, we have a bank account. A bank account has an amount, it has an interest rate, it has an account name, account number, and so forth. This all refers to identity. It describes the bank account. And likewise, we can perform actions on the bank account. For example, we can withdraw money and we can deposit money into the bank account. Those are actions we perform on that specific account. So this grouping together of nouns and verbs produces an object. And if I was creating a banking application, well, my program would orientate around bank account objects. And my program would take a look at specific bank account objects and perhaps modify the amount by running a deposit action on a specific account. And so this should now show you why we say object orientation, because our program is oriented based around objects.